I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Libby Moore. Here's part two. I love the story about the advice that your mum gave you when you were going for the interview. So would you share that? Sure. (laughs) She, and I understand. So, so again, um, Libby, sorry, but I hope your mum doesn't think that I'm paying out on it because I'm not, I'm just, I just think it's gorgeous. She will understand. And, and I really like telling this story because people listening, there's going to be a mother or a father or a grandparent who has a child or grandparent or someone in their life that's coming out. And they're thinking, I'm the only one, or what did I do wrong? So I really am happy that you're asking that so someone can relate and go, oh, okay, you know, that, that makes sense. Um, so my mom, when I was, of course, she was thrilled and excited that I would, had this interview with Oprah. And she said, well, Elizabeth, you know, if she asks you about your personal life, I don't think you should tell her that you're gay. And I said, mom, I understand why you're saying that because you want me to get this job. And I said, I want this job. You know, I I would love to work with Oprah. But if she's not comfortable working with a gay person as her chief of staff, then I'm not the right person for this job. I'm not going to go back in the closet to get this job. It's just not, that's not. And she goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. So she understood, you know. Um, And I will say that my mom, in the beginning, she was very supportive um, and I love you. And I, I, she was concerned also for my safety when I came out, I'm backing up a little bit, but when I was 27, I came out, I wanted to say that too, just in case other people are listening that have a gay child or niece or nephew or grand grandchild. Um, My mom was really concerned that people would hurt me or say bad things about me, call me names um, or homophobic people would beat me up or something. So that was her biggest concern. And, and I thankfully did not have those issues at all. And um, yeah, my mom soon, very soon after just became super supportive of every partner I ever brought home. I'm married now. She loves my wife. You know, she could not have been a better caring, supportive parent, my mom and dad and siblings, everybody welcomed my partners when I brought them home. Um, so it's you, when people are coming out, if someone is coming out listening to this, you just have to give your parents or guardians or friends and family time to get used to this idea of who you are. You're, you haven't changed as a person. Just who they think you are is not who you've been. So you just have to give them time and space to adjust. That's it. That's um, really sound advice. Yeah. Livy, just on your mum still. Um, yeah. And, I mean, I do. <laughs> my mum's going to love do. it. <laughs> Oh, I do it with my kids too and they just roll their eyes, you know, when you say, you know, sit up straight, don't rock on the chair, oh, watch yeah. your table manners. Oh, yeah. So would you please share the story about the table manners and your mum and, and, and you ending up where you ended up because I just love this story. So let's see, um, when we were kids growing up, um, my, my mother who grew up in the Washington, D.C. area and my father grew up in this town where we were living, Berlin, Maryland, um, so my, my mom was very big on manners and um, table manners and manners in general, just being gracious and things like that. So whenever we were kids, when we were eating, she would say, um, that's funny. Now that you mentioned my mom, I'm thinking she's going to be saying, Elizabeth, why didn't you fix your hair and all that kind of stuff? But I'm just going to let that go so I can relax. <laughs> um, so my mom would say, okay, kids, you know, put your napkin in your lap. Um, this is your salad fork, this is your dinner fork, this is the knife, here's a soup spoon, this is dessert, bup, bup, bup. this is your water glass, this is a wine glass. She was very particular about manners. And we would all just be like, oh, I mean, we were little kids, we were young. And I think when I was around 13 or 14, probably, she said, you know, Elizabeth, put your napkin in your lap. Remember, when you're eating at the White House someday, you want to be comfortable with your table man- manners. And I said, Mom, I mean, look where we live. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, we're not going to be eating at the White House. Just like, you know, that kind of thing. Well, um, you know, how many years later, 30 some years later, 30, 40 years later, um, Oprah was receiving the Kennedy Center honors and President Barack Obama was bestowing her with this award when he was president. And she was one of, I think, five people selected that year to receive this. And she could bring five guests to this whole weekend of festivities. And she brought her partner, Stedman Graham, and her best friend, Gail, and Gail's two kids, and me. 
And at one point there was um, a State Department dinner in honor of all the people honoring the, receiving this award. And it was, uh, you know, it was Miss Winfrey and Mr. Graham and um, Julia Roberts and her husband, Danny Motor and Vernon Jordan and his wife and Gail and her two kids and me. And I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, and we're going to receptions at the White House. And I felt very comfortable with my manners. And I went outside and called my mom and just said, remember the time we were kids and used to say, put your napkin in your lap because when you eat at the White House someday. So, and we just had such a great laugh about it because it's true. So, you know, part of the reason why I love that story so much is because parents listening to this, planting that seed of thought, even though as a kid, I was like, that's ridiculous. How's that ever going to happen? My, my mother was planting a seed in us that anything is possible, dream big, anything is possible. And when it's happening, I want you to have the right table manners, you know? So um, I, I love that. I love that story so much. Uh, I, I do too, Libby. Uh, <laughs> I hope my kids take note of this. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, I'm sure they will. Libby, you speak about uh, all those interesting people that you've met. Who, who is the most impressive person that you met during that time, apart from Oprah, obviously? Yeah, I would say the most obvious is Oprah. I mean, it, it sounds... But truly, there's just what I learned from her and what I continue to learn from her all these years later is, is just astounding. So that's the obvious is her. Um, and then two, I really would say Dr. Maya Angelou, the great author and poet and orator. And she is just, to me, she was just incredible. And also there's a boy named Maddie Stepanek who was on her show many times and he died a couple weeks before his 14th birthday. He had a very rare form of um, uh, muscular dystrophy. Am I saying that right? Muscular dystrophy. <laughs> and just what I learned from him as a little kid, what he used to, it was so, so simple what he talked about, but it was so profound in a way. It's like a little prophet. Mm. Um, and it's just really going to South Africa and all the regular people that we met there that really changed mm -hmm. my life. Libby, no job is ever perfect and no person is ever perfect mm -hmm. and you make your fair share of mistakes. But um, And I, I love the story that you share about um, the passports. So if, if yeah. you could tell us about that. And I love it because um, you own, you, 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 you owned the mistake that you made. And I just imagine how difficult it must have been, um, how horrified you must have been to realise what you'd done mm -hmm. and right. equally as um, horrifying it would have been to go to and wake Oprah up and tell us. So please mm -hmm. tell the story. Yes, so we were um, flying from Chicago to South Africa and she, it was going to be, um, it was in December of, uh, uh, December, January trip. So it, it, she was going to be opening her school. It was the official opening of her school, the Oprah and Free Leadership Academy for Girls. She had, I think, 150 VIP family and friends flying over from the United States to be there at this opening. It was a massive event. We were celebrating New Year's Eve as well with all the guests that were going to be there. We were going to different cities. So long story short, we left Chicago and um, we flew to New York. We picked up her best friend, Gail, got on the plane in New York City, and then we continue on. So we would fly to um, the Canary Islands to refuel and then from there fly to South Africa, which was our final destination. And the whole trip, I mean, door to door is, for, with all that, was maybe... 20 hours, 24, something like that. Okay, 18 to 24 mm. hours. Anyway, between New York City and the Canary Islands, I'm playing Scrabble with Gail, and Miss Winfrey was sleeping in the back, and um, I realized I forgot my passport over the Atlantic. It's a private plane, so it's not like you're going through TS, you know, security and having to show your passport. Normally, we had a system set up where I would get the passport. My, my assistant would say, do you have the passports? I'd say, yes. Then we'd get in the car at the studio and the bodyguard would turn around and say, let me see your passports. And 
Ms. Humphrey and I would show them the passports and then we'd get to the plane and the pilots would say, okay, let's get your passports. Well, for some reason that day, probably because we were all so crazed, every line of defense was forgotten. So halfway over the Atlantic Ocean, I realized, oh my God, I forgot my passport. I go up and I tell the pilots, so like, oh my God, I forgot to ask for the passports. And then I sit back down and I, real I was like, look, I will sit in jail in the Canary Islands. I don't care. I'm not going to hold this plane back or Miss Winfrey from going to this big, you know, moment in her life to launch the school and la la la. I was, I was just, and then as I sat down back in my seat, I realized, oh my God, I don't think I got her passport either. So I go back, she's sleeping. I wake her, excuse me, Miss Winfrey, did you bring your passport? And she's like, oh my God, I forgot my passport. I did too, I'm so sorry. So it was just this moment of, I mean, it's 101. It's assistant 101. You bring the passports and I forgot. And so she was, you know, when we landed in the Canary Islands, I talked to the head of security who was already in South Africa and explained the situation. He was able to talk to someone and said, don't worry about it. We're going to have the passports flown over the next day. Da, da, da. We have approval that you can leave the plane when you land, go to the hotel. And I'm like, whew, okay, great. It's all set. We land, we fly another 10 hours or whatever it was. We land and the director of security got on and said, I'm sorry, the person who gave us permission is at a funeral. They last for six hours. You won't be able to get off the plane until he comes back from this funeral. And we sat on the plane for another additional six hours. And the whole time she was amazing, I have to say. She, she was like the first hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. She was like, look, I'm a grown woman. I should remember my own passport. By hour five, she was like, okay, if my name was so-and-so, your, your ass would be fired right now, which, you know, was so true. And she said it in a funny way. Uh, but I have to say, again, that, that's the graciousness of, of Oprah. You know what I mean? A lot of people would be like, why? You're fired. Get out of here. Fly home. And that wasn't the case at all. But it was the worst in my mind, for 11 years, it was the worst thing that happened. Luckily for you, if she'd said that, Libby, you couldn't have gone anyway. Yeah, <laughs> if she'd exactly. Said, get I would have been stuck there. Get out. Oh, I can't well, I can't. I'm stuck. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, you're stuck with me. Not that we've been overseas a lot, but every single time I go overseas, in the weeks leading up, I had these intermittent dreams of getting my passport and getting everybody's passports. Yes. And I wake up and think, oh, my gosh, I'm glad we haven't left yet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Don't oh just let me take gosh, that heat for you. It's already done. It's not going to happen to you. Oh, thank you. Thank yes. you. I'll have to put the process in place and make sure everyone follows through. Yes. Um, Libby, you are a life coach now, so tell me what you do and and how people from in it, like in Australia um, are they able to access your um, work? Oh, good question. So yes, I do life coaching and executive coaching. It's all to me. It's actually the same thing at the core in my mind. Some people call me their executive coach, and I have companies hire me, hire me and do executive coaching. Some people call me their life coach and hire me to do that. It, at the core, we're doing the exact same thing, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. And what I really, it's interesting because I know even when I was getting my coaching certification, they're like, what's your niche and who's your market and how are you going to, what's your elevator pitch? And I've always kind of resisted uh, that, that thing like, okay, here's a package of 10 for the price of I just am very organic. I've been doing it very organic. And what I feel I'm doing, it's not, it's not, um, I'm helping people remember who they are. I'm helping people remember who they are, the power that they have within them and how to access that power, so to speak. And through these simple Fisher Price exercises that if you do that every day, you're going to start seeing results. That's how I would describe it. Do you know what Fisher Price is, by, by the way? Yeah, yeah, I okay. do. And I love, I love that analogy. Absolutely. And yeah. I love how, what you just said. I, I just think that's, that's who we all are. So yeah. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we, we all yeah. are that. Exactly. And the thing is, is that this is not new information. It's been around since the beginning of time. Um, people offer it, present it in different ways. Um, and 
for me, when I left the job with Oprah in 2012, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I, like I said, I took a year off. I called it the Libby Moore Gypsy Tour, 365 days of following my heart and just, just reconnect with myself, my family, my friends, and be open to adventures and explore. And I stopped Googling people. I started doing all these things that happen to be the opposite of what people say you have to do. So for example, when I left that job, someone said, well, Libby, now you have to be on Facebook because in order to be successful today, you need to be on Facebook. This was in 2012. And something in me, that same little something that said, go over there, that's where Audrey is, that something said to me, don't, then, then in that case, don't be on Facebook. So I said, in that case, I'm not going to be on Facebook and I'm going to prove to people that I can be successful without being on Facebook. Now it's eight and a half years later. And what most people tell me is they hate Facebook. It's toxic. It's draining. The only reason they stay on it is to keep in touch with their friends and family's photos. Other than that, they do not in general. That is what I hear eight and a half years later. So within that short span of time, it went from you must be here in order to be successful to, ugh, you know, just saying, no offense to Facebook, just saying, that's how life works. Um, and then, um, so I just, what I've really been doing in my life is peeling back the layers of, um, you know, what is the truth? Like, who am I now? Who I am now is going to be someone a little different than I was a week ago or next week. And what I, at the end of that year of taking that year and just reconnecting with people and meeting people heart to heart, energy to energy, not Googling someone like, what's their bio? Where'd they work? Who do they know? And then you go down and you sit down with someone, you act like you don't know anything about them and yet you know their whole resume and bio. So different for in this situation, like you're interviewing people, you're gonna read up. But I'm saying just when someone says, oh, you should go have lunch with this person or whatever. I wanted to go for a year and just meet people and see if I like them, having no idea anything about them. And it was so refreshing that I continue to do that. Just, I don't know anything about anyone unless I've heard, they say, oh, that person works at Coca-Cola or whatever it is. Then I might know, know that little piece, but that's it. I'm not looking up who they are, or what they have done and stuff like that. And that was so refreshing. So at the end of that year of taking a year off, people said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm going to do exactly what I've done this year. Connect with people, heart to heart, energy to energy. And people kind of rolled their eyes and were like, well, how are you going to make money doing that? And I said, I have no idea, but I love it so much. I believe the money will come. And then I think two months after that, I thought, well, I'm going to get my coaching certification because I love talking with people and helping them figure out their, uh, their way out of problems or issues and really reflect back to them the beauty and, of who they are. Right now, no matter what you've done in the past or just the beauty of who you are and tap into that energy. And so that's what I started doing. I got my coaching certification, started life coaching, then executive coaching, which then also led to something called Love X Coaching, which is bringing the energy of love back into business, which I love doing. Well, Libby, I need to say that you certainly have a gift because I was telling you before uh, before we started our interview, um, how much I loved talking or well, love chatting with you the other day when we when we caught up, and how you just you honestly you made me feel like I was the most the most important person in the world, and and that you really were interested in everything I had to say. So, and that that is a special special gift. So thank you, and so oh, you're certainly wow. where you're meant to be. Thank you. Um, now. <clears throat> No problem. It's the truth. Um, I Now, I'm going to borrow a segment from Oprah, and I have a few mm. questions that I've put together that you, uh, I'd like you to just answer, give sh short answers to. Um, and I'll, Now, the first one is, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, my very first recollection was um, I wanted to be an 18-wheeler truck driver. Do you know what that is? Like yeah, the wheel, yeah. is that yep. what you call it in Australia? Yeah. Oh, uh, semi. Yeah. Yeah. Semi. Yeah, semi exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's what I wanted to be. That was the first yeah. recollection. Then the second was I wanted to be a cowboy um, because I used to eat this cereal called sugar corn pops and I had a cowboy with a cowboy saddle. And I was like that. I want to be that, that I want to wear jeans and boots and a cowboy hat and ride horses all day. 
Um, <laughs> that was the second. And then the third thing I wanted to do was be in advertising. I wanted, I remember in high school, I wanted to be the vice president of the top advertising agency in Washington, DC, which everyone laughs at me because people are like, are there ad agencies in Washington, DC? <laughs> you know, they're in New York, LA, Chicago, but anyway, yeah. So that's what I wanted to be when I was a kid. Uh -huh. That's so interesting. Um, the second question, have you grown up yet? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> I, I I'm never in the feel process. Like I've grown up. Yeah, I'm in the process, I would say. It's, I don't think there's funny, an end to that process. Yeah. No, no. Uh, now, um, the biggest lesson you've learned in your life. Oh, that's such a good one. Oh, well, here it is. It's... I think the most powerful thing that you can do is to be yourself with all people at all times in all situations to the best of your ability, to the best of your ability. That, that is the most powerful thing you can do. And I learned that one from my own life experience to see how detrimental it was to my life when I was trying to pretend to be someone that I was not, when I was trying to pretend to be straight, when I was really gay and how, health-wise, mentally, physically, emotionally, I was at the worst point in my life. And then once I came out at 27 by being truthful about who I was, my life just took off and continues to get better and better and better. And so that was my own experience. And then working with Oprah and being by her side for 11 years and seeing how being herself was so powerful and how people that resonated with people and it freed people to be themselves. So that's it. That that's the best life lesson that I've ever learned. Good. All right. Now, um, your favorite quote. That's a really good, I don't have a favorite quote. I really do not have a favorite quote. What I like to say, it's more of a motto. This isn't really a quote is uh, nature is the new corner office. So uh, I started yes. saying that that year I took off in 2012. And I really, truly believe that, especially right now during COVID and everything, nature is the new corner office. If you've got this or a laptop, if you've got this, you can be anywhere in the world. And for yeah. most, some people, not all, but I can do my work anywhere in the world with just this. And to me, that's freedom. That's heaven. Yeah, that's um, that's a re that's actually really really great. Nature is your yeah. corner. Yeah, nature is the new corner it's, office. It is nature is the new corner office, right? right. Okay, I'm going to yeah. pick that up. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> not the twentieth floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah of yeah. a high rise. Yeah. For some people, it is not not for me. Yeah, um, Libby, how? as individuals, can we make the world a better place? Mm. Learn to love yourself. That's it. And I do not mean egotistical love. I mean simple, basic love. It's something I still work on to this day. Um, you know, again, there are many points in my life where I did not love myself. If, if someone had said, do you love yourself? I would have said, absolutely. But I really didn't because I would have chosen different um, things, different opportunities, different people, different pop, 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 if I really, truly love mm -hmm. myself. So to me, that's, that's how you change the world is you learn to love yourself. Look in the mirror every day and say, I love you, Kelly, you know, whatever your name is. I love you, Libby. I love you, mm -hmm. Kelly. That's from the work of Louise Hay, who wrote a book, You Can Heal Your Life in the 80s. It changed my life by just doing that one simple thing. I do it every single morning. It's about learning to love yourself you know, and respect yourself. That is so true because I think if you have that um, love for yourself and, and that happiness and peace within you, then that's what you go and convey to the world, don't you think? Absolutely. And we're all energy. We are all energy beings, atom cells and molecules moving. That's energy. Our thoughts are creating feelings. That is information that goes into that energy that's rippling out. So those people that are mean and um, cruel and say horrible things. I, I guarantee you, 
that matches how they feel about themselves on the inside. And people who are loving and accepting and they don't say mean things about people shows how much they love themselves. We're all rippling out that energy. Yeah, yeah. Now, one last question is, because uh, I know you're living um, in Canada now. Yeah. So apart from America and Canada, what is your favourite country? Ooh, I mean, wow, that's really tough. I do love Australia. I, I have been there once with Oprah when we were working, you know, when she did the show from the Sydney Opera House. Oh, yeah, that was oh, huge. Man, that was yeah. so exciting. Um, that was my first experience there. And then I came back two other times to do talks there. I love Australia. And I have to say, I love South Africa. My wife, my partner is from South Africa, Cape Town. And I love that country. I thought when I went there 23 times with Oprah for work, I thought, okay, when I left, I thought, I think I'm done. I've done South Africa. I don't think I'll ever be back here again. And then I ended up many years later falling in love with someone from South Africa and <laughs> continue to go back once or twice a year. So I, mm. South Africa and Australia have to be two of my favorites. Next well, to the US. That's, that's, that's the right answer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you know, I, um, I've not been to Canada and I, it's on my bucket list, uh, yes. but I know I love it because any Canadian person that I've met are just the most beautiful, friendliest people. And, yes. um, and I think that's what makes a country so good, isn't it? The people that are in it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They are so friendly. I mean, I lived in Toronto for a year. I've lived in Vancouver now for about nine months. It is stunning. People across the board are so friendly here. Mm -hmm. As are the Aussies. Yeah, yeah, Aussies. Aussies. <laughs> yeah. And, and I would say the people from Maryland as well. Maryland, yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> Libby, thank you so much for giving me this time today, especially when you're just back from your beautiful holiday. So I really appreciate it. And um, uh -huh. I know that. Well, I always get a lot out of chatting with you and I know others will get so much from, from hearing you. And um, hopefully uh, if anyone's wanting a life coach, they might just get in touch with you and they can do that through your website, can't they? Yes, LibbyMoore.com. And actually um, I'm going to be doing some global coaching conversations. So I'm going to be announcing that pretty much just through my website. So it's LibbyMoore.com. You can sign up for uh, uh, the email list there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, and and um, yeah. Instagram is Libby Moore Gypsy Tour. Not that I post that much, but that is the Instagram. Yeah. Thank you, Libby. I really, really appreciate your time. Kelly, thank you so much. I love this conversation. I love this, the one we had before and before and seeing you in Rockhampton. So thank you. I look forward to coming back there someday. Oh, well, you'll have to come and visit us in the bush when you do. I would love that. That would be great. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Libby. Thanks so much for watching our video. I hope you enjoyed it. And please try to remember to just click on the subscribe button so we can keep you updated with everything that's happening. Thank you.